Good morning and welcome to OpenSci 2012. I'm Anthony So with the program on Global Health and Technology Access at the Stanford School. This all began as, we, um, as an effort to engage our students in the Designing Innovation for Global Health course, an exercise of setting the table for policy dialogue. We started out with a modest goal. Our program would fund just two panels during last week's Global Health Week. But the ideas for the conference inspired and proposed by our students in this graduate conference for this graduate seminar were so exciting that we just couldn't stop just there. The result was OpenSci 2012. A few words about the motivations and hopes for this conference and the agenda for the next day and a half. Why focus on opening scientific collaboration for innovation for global health? In just over a decade, we have seen the price of triple drug therapy for AIDS fall from over $10,000 per person per year to less than 100, lowering the price of hope. And while we have witnessed a remarkable rise in spending for AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria over the same period, this is flatlined. Now, I'm not suggesting that this flatlining also reflects the EKG or EEG activity of any of our elected officials, but perhaps the hearts and minds, and our, as well as our system of innovation in global health, could use a good jolt of disruptive innovation. Millions still face neglected diseases like Chagas, Leishmaniasis, and sleeping sickness without a cure. And collectively, an estimated 25 million Americans have one rare disease or another, many also without cure. But the drug R&D pipeline has faltered, as we will hear. While at the same time, the costs of R&D have soared. Some claim to far more than $800 million or $1.3 billion to bring a single new drug to market. If the barriers are high for new treatments for diseases common to those in industrialized countries, imagine what they are for diseases where pain markets are small. Adapting a diagnostic or a small rural clinic in Sub-Saharan Africa, repurposing an existing drug for a secondary indication, a life-saving one in a low or middle income country, or a rare disease in an industrialized country. Or creating a vaccine targeting strains endemic, perhaps, to those in developing countries. Perhaps today is also about lowering the price of hope. An important step to meeting the twin goals of innovation and access may involve rethinking and yes, even re-engineering, how we bring new technologies to market, and even existing technologies to people. We will focus in OpenSci 2012 on enabling needed innovation to move forward through open science, citizen science, and integrating innovation at, through, at the base of the pyramid. What new models might open scientific collaboration and lower the barriers to innovation? How can we engage not only communities of scientists, but of the wider public as well? And how can we involve those in the bottom billion, in the process of innovation, in hopes that products coming to market will be affordable and appropriate to their needs, and does not a system that fails to deliver even existing treatments to those in need, one that is one that cries out for innovation. Addressing these issues, we have an extraordinary lineup of speakers, with experiences from industry to civil society, from rare diseases to neglected diseases. In what ways might rare and neglected diseases be two sides of the same coin? Both face small markets, one where the numbers are small, but the unit costs are potentially high, the other where the numbers afflicted are huge, but the ability to pay requires that the unit costs to be very low. But you all will have the opportunity to do more than just listen today, or right, and tomorrow, for our students have put together three breakout sessions, each on a challenge in global health that we hope might be better tackled with your input. One discussing how to enable greater innovation of ready-to-use therapeutic foods for severely malnourished children. A second, creating an open collaboration platform for medical devices that might be particular use to groups like Engineer World Health. And a third, focus on conceptualizing <coughs> a new collaborative competition that might bring breakthrough approaches in thinking on how to improve the rational use of antibiotics, particularly at the base of the pyramid. Inspired by, hopefully, our plenary panels on open science this morning, the multimedia look that we'll take on how technology from games to mobile phones can mobilize citizens for global health, <coughs> an interactive workshop this afternoon on innovation at the base of the pyramid, we invite you to join one of the breakout sessions later this afternoon for what we hope will be some problem-smashing discussions. And again tomorrow morning for their report back from each track, moderated by UNICEF's Chief of Health, our opening speaker this morning. Consistent with the original vision for this conference, you will see the students from our actually designing innovation for global health course, facilitating the panels, making presentations, shepherding the breakout group sessions, and reporting back tomorrow what promises to be interesting recommendations for the way forward. Before we begin, let me offer words of thanks, particularly to our speakers, 
and also to, especially to our students and our graduate center of designing innovation for global health, our program assistants, especially to Quentin Ruiz Esparza, in our program without whom OpenSci 2012 would not have been possible. Leading us off and here to introduce our opening speaker is Khadija Bhatti. Thank you for joining us today. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to you all Dr. Mickey Chopra. Uh, Dr. Chopra currently serves as the Chief of Health and Associate Director of Programs at UNICEF. Dr. Chopra hails from a rich and varied leg legacy in global health that has led him around the world working in issues ranging from maternal and child health to HIV AIDS mitigation. At UNICEF, Dr. Chopra leads organizational initiatives in maternal, newborn, and child health, um, including but not exclusive to child immunization, HIV AIDS prevention and treatment. Prior to joining UNICEF, Dr. Chopra worked extensively in South Africa, where he directed the Health Systems Research Group of the South Africa Medical, Medical, Council, uh, Medical Research Council and served as faculty at the University of the Western Cape. Once a district medical officer in Kozala, Natal, Dr. Chopra comes to us with tremendous experience in rural health care and as a renowned authority on the barriers to development in Southern and Eastern Africa. Dr. Chopra has published over 70 peer-reviewed articles and contributed to multiple books. Not a stranger to the university setting, he holds medical and medical sociology degrees from the University of Southampton, a PhD from the University of, Ups of Uppsala in Sweden, and an MPH from the mm -hmm. London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We are utterly delighted to have Dr. Chopra amongst us, kick-starting the conference. We look forward to his indubitably insightful remarks on the challenges to innovation for global health. With that said, please join me in rapturously welcoming Dr. Chopra. Thank you, Khadija, and uh, thank you, Anthony, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm afraid it sort of goes downhill from, from there. But, uh, <laughs> what I want to talk to you today actually is a little bit uh, different from perhaps uh, some of the main thrusts of today. What I want to really talk about uh, is not so much bringing new products into the market or into the hands of the people who need it the most, but it's looking at existing products and existing innovations and how do we get them to the bottom billion, as, as Anthony put it, uh, and the innovation and the collaboration and the partnership required uh, to do that. In particular, I want to use a case study of how in, within UNICEF it's requiring us to rethink our way of working uh, and the skill set that we need and the perspective that we, we need to bring uh, to our work uh, to, to sort of shape things up a little bit and, 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 and rethink. Uh, UNICEF actually procures more than one and a half billion dollars worth of um, uh, commodities, drugs, medicines every year. Um, some of it is directly from our own resources, and some of it is on behalf of governments and on behalf of global agencies such as the Vaccine Initiative. But not all uh, products and commodities are created equal. So we've ha we have things like antiretrovirals, vaccines, uh, for, and, and, and bed nets, which um, we've been very successful in working with uh, big pharma mostly, but also with um, manufacturers from the south in creating and crowding in um, um, manufacturers and, and innovation, and either developing and getting new vaccines from, from the northern markets to the south very, very quickly, as with uh, the new pneumo and rotor vaccines, uh, which are now rolling out, as many of you know, in many African and Asian countries at a price of about 80% lower than it is in the northern markets. And similarly, uh, the, the work around antiretrovirals, which has been done by many others, is very well known in terms of bringing those prices down, bringing innovations, new formulations, and so forth. So I must remark, in, uh, for children, that's not the case for antiretrovirals. The, uh, there's, a, there's a dearth of formulations uh, and supply of child for children's um, uh, antiretrovirals. Uh, but there are other uh, commodities, and the majority, in fact, of medicines and commodities for women and children, which actually have languished. Um, if you look across the things such as magnesium sulfate, uh, which is a very cheap product, which actually has remarkable impact on uh, eclampsia and, pre uh, and avoiding 
um, hemorrhaging and death from eclampsia in pregnancy, the cause of, of much maternal mortality, the uptake rates uh, and the usage rates in Africa and Asia are in the low teens. So the majority of women are not getting access to a very cheap and simple product such as magnesium sulfate, even though it is uh, available uh, and there's no patenting problems or anything like that. So um, there are a number of uh, products. We've identified at least 20 uh, ranging, like I said, from things like magnesium sulfate, oxytocin in, through to antibiotics for pneumonia, the leading cause of death for children, uh, where uh, we're still having to get nurses and others to crush tablets because the dispersible form of amoxicillin, the most commonly used antibiotic, is not available uh, at prices that, that people can afford uh, in the South. So I want to take one of these uh, uh, areas of work, which is uh, diarrhea, and uh, just give you a case study of uh, the challenge that we were looking at uh, a couple of years ago when I, when I arrived at UNICEF, that diarrhea is still the second leading single cause of death amongst children, over a million deaths uh, due to diarrhea uh, every year, uh, amongst the poorest kids, as you can imagine. And that uh, we do have uh, both an existing intervention or rehydration solution, which was voted by readers of the Lancet uh, as, as one of the leading medical innovations of the 20th century. A very simple um, uh, mixture of, of uh, water, sugar, and salt, uh, which uh, basically avoid, uh, replenishes the electrolyte deficiencies and rehydrates. We also then have uh, zinc. Uh, um, uh, now also been uh, well developed. I should also acknowledge Michael here who uh, uh, did a lot of the work uh, and innovation in this field and actually put it onto the global agenda uh, uh, originally and so it's, uh, it really is a, one of the legacies of, of his work that we're talking about here. Um, but what we're finding, so we have a rehydration solution and uh, what, we've, what we're finding, though, is that two-thirds of the countries where we've had the latest demographic health survey and, and household surveys from countries, two-thirds, the actual use of oral rehydration has actually gone down, even though a million kids are still dying and the incidence of diarrhea has still not really budged much uh, in the last 10, 15 years. So all the gains that were made uh, when Michael was there had not really been built upon, and in fact there may be some um, going backwards. What's interesting also is not just that the use of oral rehydration during a diarrhea episode has gone down, but also that knowledge levels are actually increased, if not still very high. So, you know, our sort of, in UNICEF, or in many circles, a simple, simplistic um, understanding that it was just about lack of knowledge of mothers uh, to, to, the, to, to the need to use oral rehydration solution is not really tenable in many settings. So it really is about uh, more than just uh, a lack of, it, of an ignorance of, of users to, to oral rehydration solution. This is just a, uh, 10 countries uh, which have the, the largest number of um, diarrhea deaths, and it just, is a, it's a, it just gives you um, some of the numbers of deaths. So, it's, so in Nigeria, over 200,000 kids dying of diarrhea, but the oral rehydration solution uh, coverage of, epi of uh, episodes of diarrhea treated with oral rehydration solution is only 26%. As I said, zinc is a new, a relatively new discovery that zinc, uh, giving uh, a short course of zinc actually reduces the duration of diarrhea and, and substantially reduces the mortality, the death related to diarrhea. <coughs> so this is uh, something which is very cheap again uh, and should be and something that should be rolled out and you can see the coverage levels of zinc, I mean they're starting from a very low base but still have not really taken off at all in many of these countries, uh, even many years and many many studies uh, that have shown the efficacy of zinc. Now, you could turn this around, though, and look at it in a more positive fashion and actually think of it that uh, there's a huge potential here. There's a large market. You have all the, you know, hundreds of, if not, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of millions of cases um, uh, of, of, of diarrhea 
So it's a, it's a huge market potentially uh, that has huge potential to uh, change things. So this is sort of one of the key sort of switches in our thinking and uh, that happened uh, within UNICEF was then to say, well, actually, let's stop thinking of this as embracing ourselves for not doing a good enough job and look at it as opportunities. And so just to highlight three um, opportunities here. Um, so one is to, is to get zinc uh, to those who are already reaching uh, to, to add zinc uh, to those who are already getting oral rehydration solution. And we reckon that, so like I said, about an average of 30% of kids already get oral rehydration solution. So that's some sort of eat first um, bite, if you like, that we could get zinc uh, if we could co-package or look at ways of connecting the two. Then if you look at the data, about 40, 45% of cases are treated, but they're not treated with oral rehydration um, solution or with uh, zinc. They're often treated with antibiotics inappropriately or with other uh, medications and so forth. So there's a potential opportunity there if we could switch people from using those to using uh, ORS and zinc. And then the remainder is where uh, people are not treating at the moment and how can we tap into that. And then it's looking at where these behaviors, where do people seek treatment, how do they seek treatment and care as well. So just putting that together, we started to think of it in terms of the demand side uh, issues and, 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 and looking a bit more carefully at some of the reasons why people look at other products instead of oral rehydration and, and zinc and, and what the potential is there. There are significant and important supply side issues. Quite often people are going to, to other products because the availability of ORS and zinc is not always there. Um, and also the way in which it is provided and supplied, and I'll come on to that in a minute. And then obviously there is the, uh, the, the enabling environment around the regulatory and funding and so forth. So I'm just going to uh, go through quickly some of the insights and the space for innovation and partnership and, and, and collaboration uh, that each of these um, um, areas provide in the, in the field of ore hydration and zinc. Just to start off with, just to give you a sense of um, the market and what, uh, and, 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 and I can't emphasize enough how very different this way of thinking is for us in, in the UN. Um, so it's really working with the private sector to start to understand what's available in countries, both in the public sector, but also in terms of manufacturers and in the private sector. One of the things that we were finding is that um, there is some product differentiation happening in some of them in the countries, but not enough. Um, and I'll come back to this, but uh, one thing that mothers were frequently saying to us uh, when, we, when we spoke to them and, and, uh, was that the oral rehydration solution that we procure as UNICEF and as governments in the public sector is just a very, it's in a very bland white packet and it actually tastes pretty horrible. It's, it's got a lot of salt, it's got the salt in it, so it's actually not very tasty either. And so some uh, um, uh, entrepreneurs have started to get flavored uh, and more attractive packaging of oral rehydration solution, and um, we weren't really understanding how successful that was and, and how they were positioning that within the market. And there was a cost differential. They were pitching the flavors of oral rehydration at a different market and a different group of mothers um, than the ones um, uh, which the public sector was targeting. And of course, um, as you can imagine, it's the public sector poorer kids who are more likely to die anyway of diarrhea than, than the ones that this, these kind of factors were, were targeting. Supply is a, is a big challenge, particularly for, for zinc, uh, um, that the um, India is, is, is pretty good in terms of uh, the manufacturers and, and the competition and the innovation going on within the oil rehydration market. But, the other, Nigeria, for example, which is among, you know, the second largest uh, number of kids dying from diarrhea, had very little um, um, suppliers, uh, quite expensive, uh, as, you know, $1.50 almost for a sachet 
compared to 10 cents to 35 cents in, in India. Um, there's, only one, there's only one international zinc supplier, and so once again, extremely expensive, uh, more than three uh, three dollars uh, for, uh, for 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 the zinc tablets. Um, whereas um, on the antibiotic side, there were a lot of people involved in that market and, and a lot of suppliers as well. So we were losing out, particularly in Africa, um, high prices, low number of um, suppliers. Um, but on, on the competition side, if you like, with the antibiotics, um, plenty of local producers um, um, getting out with, 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 with some of the, the, the antibiotics, which are inappropriate for most of childhood diarrhea. Zinc is, uh, has been uh, a particular problem, though we are now getting over this, but still it highlights some of the broader challenges that not just zinc faces, but other uh, low-cost commodities can often face. Um, one is that uh, is the regulatory aspect um, that it makes a huge difference where the zinc is re if it's registered as a medical product, um, then uh, you, the whole process of, of having to register the product, uh, which is expensive and cumbersome, and if there isn't a market for the product or, 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 or good enough market for the product, no manufacturer is willing to go through that process, and it can be to much delay. And that is something which is you're seeing a number across a number of uh, these low, low value commodities as they call in particular. The other aspect I wanted to bring out uh, was that to get a more nuanced and sophisticated understanding of care seeking, and that that can make quite a big difference in how one uh, looks at where innovation needs to come in. And I just wanted to highlight the, the differences that we're seeing across countries where, uh, so these, this is where basically mothers take a go for care seeking for when a child has diarrhea, uh, based on analysis of household, national household surveys. And just simply to make the point that, you know, in, in a Bangladesh situation uh, where the vast majority of care seeking is happening in the private, uh, both informal uh, this is the formal private sector and the informal private sector um, makes a huge difference as to where you need to be in terms of uh, uh, changing supply issues, changing um, availability and behavior uh, versus, say, in Ethiopia, uh, where the vast majority is in the public sector um, as well. So it seems simple, but it's something which we've not done enough of is to, to understand uh, more the specifics of care seeking and where uh, care seeking is occurring. So just to finish off, uh, just to give you some a sense of where we're heading with this work and what we're doing now with it, uh, is really starting to uh, uh, summarize some of the challenges and, and the gaps where innovation and bringing in new um, thinking needs to be happening, both in terms of the working from the regulatory aspect through to the sales and distribution component of this. Um, and just to finish off with three particular areas where we feel we've been a bit weak and we need to really uh, work much more and, and just to, sh to get the conversation starting uh, with you all here. Uh, I'm going to just highlight three areas. One is to, to how do we get suppliers into this market, get excited about it, feel there is a potential market here where uh, it is worth investing in innovation uh, and new ways of doing things. How do we start to get some of these distribution and supply chain issues um, resolved? And then how do we start to align the supply and demand side of the market? Just to give you um, brief glimpses of some of the work we're doing, is starting to talk to, uh, to suppliers about what their perception of the market is, uh, what do they think about the potential for uh, profits or for, for, for money to be made. And these are just some quotes from, from a study we've just completed uh, looking at different, in India, looking at different parts of the market. Uh, but also, this is also Kenya and Africa. So we've done, with looking at ten, the 10 leading countries for diarrhea and really trying to do a more rigorous examination of, of the perceptions of suppliers, of actual and potential suppliers. Um, and once again, the um, this is also about uh, bringing in donors and getting them excited about this area that diarrhea is still 
uh, a big cause of death. It's one that we can bring down very quickly. So how can we leverage uh, donor resources to get excitement and get um, uh, focus on, on suppliers to come into the market? Uh, and looking at some of the um, uh, um, messaging uh, and the uh, advocacy that we can do around this as well. <coughs> we also recognize um, uh, the need to really try to unlock some of the bottlenecks in specific countries that are causing very high prices and, 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 and real um, supply side challenges. <coughs> I'm highlighting two examples here around Nigeria um, where there's a Byzantine number of rules and laws which are preventing um, uh, IP and South-South collaborations, so we're really working with the ministry there to try to understand that and, and, and block it. Um, and also looking at the um, uh, some of the in Uganda, where we don't have a functioning local market, and yet we're stopping uh, imports coming in of, uh, of of cheaper products. So what it basically means is that the poor in Uganda are not either getting local produce, let alone at all, not benefiting from uh, cheap procurement from outside. Uh, just the final two slides, just to, to, to say this is not just about supply issues and manufacturing, it's also about understanding consumers and, and users, uh, as well as distributors and retailers. It's another um, group which um, uh, we haven't been innovative. Uh, we haven't really looked at uh, retailers in, in, in many of these countries who could potentially be product placing and more aggressively promoting um, or, or S and zinc uh, for, for diarrhea. Uh, and so we are doing some work with them and also with, uh, so in terms of product placement and channels, but also understanding uh, the, you know, like I said, flavoring products, uh, the potential role of flavoring products, how much willing, willingness to pay uh, for products. I mean, one of the challenges with oral rehydration has been that it doesn't actually stop reduce the duration of diarrhea, it just reduces the um, serious outcomes of diarrhea. So mothers, one of the reasons that mothers have not been, and carers have not been too keen on oral rehydration is it doesn't stop the diarrhea. Um, zinc is better in that sense, and so maybe the combination of the two can also help us to, to unlock this. So a bit of a quick whiz through of some of the uh, ways of thinking and, and, and try attempts that we're trying to do of bringing innovation and collaboration and new ways of thinking to an old product as well as a relatively new one, uh, but really to highlight the challenges where it's not a glamorous, where we don't have a large global fund for, uh, uh, for diarrhea and oral rehydration solution and zinc. So it's something which we're going ha to have to build from below, if you like. Uh, but yet the potential, both in terms of life saved, uh, uh, is, is absolutely huge. And, and just to finish off by emphasizing that this has huge ripple effects because we know that diarrhea is one of the leading causes of malnutrition uh, and the subsequent, even kids who survived diarrhea are suffering um, cognitive and intellectual deficits because of the loss of micronutrients and malnutrition that is related to diarrhea as well. So solving this um, has important implications, both in terms of life save and future development. And so, forth. so thank you. So in this session, you talked a lot about the different supply side interventions that we can take to increase the access to ORS and zinc um, in a lot of countries where demand is high. Uh, so a lot about aligning supply and demand in general and um, you know what we can do to bring these things from market to, to the bottom. Um, and so just for a few minutes, we're going to take some questions now. So if anyone has, and if you will, please stand up and, and Introduce yourself. <laughs> so, Mike Merson, very nice, uh, Global Health Institute, nice, very nice. You really nailed, I think, in your last part, I think what's really important. And two things. One, that for 25, 30 years, the issue was the, the rehydration salts don't stop diarrhea. And the thing about zinc, if I understand the data, does cut it down 
not huge, but hopefully enough that the, you could maybe sell the product as anti-diarrheal, not just to replace the salts. I don't know if you've, you intimated you're thinking about that, and it's an interesting question because I, I think it might, you know, it might drive it if you feel comfortable with it. It's not going to stop the diarrhea, but it certainly would diminish it. My, so I want to encourage that. My, my real question, though, is I, I, um, I now, against my better judgment, <laughs> are on a WHO committee on, on all this. Uh, and uh, and uh, I was there two weeks ago, and they showed some data, which to me really is interesting in light of your presentation. Apparently, diarrhea mortality has continued to drop quite significantly. I mean, 60, 70 percent in the last 20, 30 years even though rates of rehydration use, as you say, of salt use have not, have not gone up that much. That's an interesting question about why that's happened. And it raises the issue of the remaining debts, say there are 800,000 or a million debts a year, you know better than I, how much of that is really going to be reduced further by this approach or whether your last comment that this is really a nutrition issue and we really need to think even even more elaborately, perhaps, to get at the final group of mortalities. I know this is a complicated question, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the challenges with these mortality numbers is that they are, you know, it is basically assumptions and modeling quite a lot. And in particular, the recent estimates, it's what you think about what's happening in India, because India has about a third of all diarrhea deaths in the world. So. Um, uh, and and so the, the recent estimates, which do bring down the number of deaths from diarrhea from, from, from over a million down to about 800, 750 to 800,000, are causing some you know, interest in the community. And there is, uh, we haven't seen the, the, pub, the publication hasn't come out yet, so it's difficult to know. Um, but those those of us who have seen the, the presentation that ha I, I mean myself have some, it is about what the, the causes of death in India. Uh, which are not based on um, are based on some surveys that, that are happening there, and those of you who follow literature will know that if you just change a few assumptions, as you've seen with malaria, you can almost quadruple the number of deaths from a disease just by changing some of the assumptions. So, uh, but having said that, I think you're right, Mike. I mean, it is good news. I think diarrhea deaths, I mean, even even accounts for some of the confidence intervals are coming down. So it does raise the question of. Um, what else? How do we? What else needs to be done? I think what's going to be interesting: uh, nutrition definitely um, stunting rates and malnutrition rates have remained stubbornly high and extremely high uh, in many countries, even where mortality rates have come down quite substantially. So, 30, 40 percent of kids remain stunted in countries which have halved their mortality rates. So, what we're what we're getting better at uh, are getting some of these vaccines and some of these. Uh, this is on the back of the work that Mike and others did in the 80s of really getting primary care to deliver um, some life-saving interventions. But what the kids are still doing is living in environments um, uh, which are very poor uh, and, 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 and hence the chronic issues of malnutrition they're hitting. So I, I completely agree, Mike, that it's going to be requiring more than just getting um, you know, all rehydration and sink to these kids. It is going to be about now, what's interesting is in the nutrition community, there is also, as you know, there's this global alliance for improved nutrition, which is all about bringing industry into the and innovation through fortification. Um, so, so even within the nutrition community, which has traditionally been uh, one of uh, integration and, and food and agriculture and, and, and as well as uh, behavior change, is now also um, having the wind of change in terms of innovation. And, and, and public private partnership coming in. So I think it is gonna, it's an interesting time um, and one which I think the work that, that's happening here and, and the forward thinking about how to accelerate um, some of these processes is gonna, it's, it's, it's very important. So let's take one more question. Yes, uh, my name is Ram Ramabhadran. I'm a former pharmaceutical biotech uh, executive, so person. And I just would like to raise the issue of getting companies into this business. It's just almost you're barking up the wrong tree. What would seem more appropriate is to convince the governments, like if you take India, you have CDRI or somebody like that, and if it's manufacturing zinc, it's a, it's a slam dunk. And plus, 
when the government does it, regulation becomes much easier. So is the, the effort of trying to get companies, unless you have Ready Labs doing a philanthropic arm or something like that, is this even feasible? And the second quick question is, I heard a comment from WHO, you guys belong to the same organization, UN. How do you coordinate? Or what do you do? <laughs> 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 uh, um, yeah, I mean, just, I mean, we do, call, I mean, uh, we, we have very good, you know, what's interesting with WHO is that um, there are many different, going down this road, it, it becomes much more complex because it's not just the child and adolescent health section of WHO, you also have to then look at the medicine section, the intellectual property component, and maybe Mike can comment, but you know, one of the challenges within WHO is, is to bring these different, I mean, you have the, for, for, for the pharmaceutical side, also the um, um, pre-qualification um, arm of WHO as well. And, uh, which, so if any one of these parts of WHO are not functioning optimally, we just stall in the market. So pre-qualification, where pre-qualification is that we cannot procure uh, from a company unless WHO has gone through and checked their safety and checked their, their process um, to make sure that the products are safe. Um, but because of the recent uh, cutbacks that they've been suffering, they don't have the capacity to, to do that. It's limited. So therefore, even when we have governments keen to get in and procure and, 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 and get into this, uh, we cannot um, proceed until we get WHO to come in and do the pre qualification mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right that um, the collaboration with WHO is absolutely critical because they have certain normative roles that, that we don't have and we cannot proceed without them um, being at the table and giving the go ahead. Um, I take your point around uh, that it's not easy to bring uh, manufacturers in, and that in, in particularly around in, in some of the um, southern countries. Um, but this is where I think UNICEF has to play a more proactive role because I think, you know, Nigeria, you know, it's a very fragmented market. And so it, it, a manufacturer will look at, you know, a few hundred thousand sachets of oil rehydration, it's not worth setting up any production. And that's what's happening is that each state procures its own little bit or which NGO procures its own little bit. So what we're trying to do as UNICEF is, with our sort of branding and positioning, is to start to try and get pool procurement um, to, to basically create a, an attractive enough proposition for, for, for entrepreneurs to come in, particularly in products which don't require sophisticated manufacturing processes to, to be there. So we're working with Global Fund, for example, of saying um, instead of each country procuring its own and we've done this with Bednets now, so we've pool procured enough to persuade a company in Tanzania uh, to set up a plant and to get pre-qualified, and now they're producing 100 million bed nets that we procure on behalf of Global Fund for Africa. So they're no longer imported from Japan and Norway. So I agree it's not an easy task, but one which, um, uh, if we don't do it, uh, you know, governments may have a role, but in, you know, India is exceptional in the size it already has. Many of these countries, governments can't, you know, themselves can't, can't take this on. Okay. So we won't have time for any more questions, but hopefully you all will get opportunities to interact with Dr. Chopra throughout the conference. Um, so in our next session, we're going to be talking with Dr. Bernard Munoz and uh, R.T. Rai about some of the upstream challenges of getting uh, these innovations into the market in the first place. So uh, with that being said, now we'll transition to our second session. Thank you, Dr. Chapman.